Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I'm continuing tonight looking at the Hebrew language. See, I believe the Hebrew language is the pure language that's referred to in Sephaniah chapter 3 in the Old Testament. I made that declaration two messages ago and I still make it tonight. And I believe it's the heavenly language along with the language that was used and given to mankind originally. So let's just continue on that thought on Hebrew being the pure language and the language that will be used by Jesus in his return. That's still yet ahead. But before we go there, let's go to the book of Genesis. Just quickly follow me because I'm not going to stay here and I got about an hour to finish this message tonight. So I have to go quickly. I was always wondering as I read Genesis who God was talking to and who and what not only who was he talking to, but what language did he speak? And of course, you ask most Christians, it's some heavy language. It's tongues. I never bought into that. And there's many reasons why, which I cannot really present to you in this series, but maybe some other series, especially when I get into tongues, you'll have a better understanding why I never really accepted that as an answer. You go to verse 14, for instance, in chapter 1. And God said, of course, let there be lights. And God said. I always wondered, was God speaking also to someone else? And you read through the book of Genesis, and God said, or God called the firmament of heaven. He gave it a name. Well, usually when you give something a name, a language goes with the process. A language is there as a foundational understanding of what you're trying to communicate to someone or some things. I believe there was angelical beings at the time also already created, where God said he gave out his command using a language, and as I said before, I think it was the last message I preached, if you read the book of Enoch, there are some powerful angels control in control of the universe. There are assignments of making sure certain things happen concerning stars, concerning even this planet, wind, air, how the stars were set up, what happens in the heavenlies. See, we as a Christian just believe God said and poof, everything just happened. Well, definitely God said something. Whether that's the, the accurate information in what actually happened, or did God said, in other words, God gave his command, and his creation at that point, whatever he created, followed up on his command and was part of the elemental process of putting things that most people don't even understand or most of us can't not even understand. That was part of a creative, creative process that God created and then he said, okay, build this universe. Build this universe. Now, we'll never know for sure, but if you understand the book of Enoch, we know this much. Angelical beings have the assignment, not just in the heavenly part of the universe, but also of this earth, of what happens to it in its set times. 
how it's supposed to be taken care of, kind of a caretaker role. And certain things are not going to happen because of that caretaking role that these angelical beings are responsible for, are in charge of, in other words. But that's all speculation. We've given some insights, at least as far as the caretaking, caretaking role, if you believe the Book of Enoch, I believe that to be true. So that's not hard to believe. God created the elements. It's not a far stretch to believe then if God created the elements that he gave the assignments to his angelic beings to, okay, do this with them. Man has the ability with created elements. They can't create any of those elements, but the created elements that God's already created, man has the ability to create something from nothing. Just looking at all the innovations from manufacturing, engineering, to technology of all sorts in the last hundred years. Things that were created that 500 years ago nobody thought was ever even possible. Why? Because mankind was given the ability, because it had a brain, to take those elements and eventually do something with them. Have an understanding what could be done with them. I'm not saying the angelic beings created the elements, but maybe, just maybe, through the spoken language that God communicated, that he created, gave the command, say, go to work, get busy. Get busy, Michael, get busy, Gabriel, get busy, whoever. We got work to do. Roll up your heavenly sleeves and let's, angelical sleeves and let's get busy. You get it? You see, and then God, and God said, let us make man in our image. Who is he talking to again? And then you see in verse 28, this is the first spoken command given to mankind. It appears here in Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them and God said unto them. So Adam and Eve were created with the ability to understand God. And obviously Adam and Eve were given the creative ability and the knowledge, not the creative ability, but the knowledge to communicate back to him, which we'll see later. So a language had to be in place. But what language? What language? What was the language that God used with Adam? And what language did Adam use starting with his first offspring? So you see that in first. 28 and God blessed them and God said unto them and he gave them orders and instruction this is what I want you to do what I gave you charge of and then you see in chapter 2 verse 16 the Lord God commanded that man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat once again, another command, another, well, maybe it was just mind reading. Show me anywhere in scripture you could even verify that to be true. I've heard that nonsense being, I actually read that nonsense somewhere. Maybe God and Adam were just going through some type of mind reading process. They didn't even have to speak. No, it says, and God said. It was not some mind telepathic messages that were going back and forth between God and man. And then, after giving the command, you see in verse 18, and the Lord God said again, it is not good that man should be alone. Did God, was God talking to Adam? To, to the Adam? To Adam, excuse me? Or was he talking to somebody else? I was wondering about that. Who was God talking to? And once again, a language is being used. And God, Lord God said, Is it not good that man should be alone? I will make him a, I will make him a help meet for him. And then obviously, the creative process of Eve was carried out. 
You got that? I believe God communicated with Adam and Eve using the Hebrew language, which is the pure language, not only of mankind, but of celestial beings too. And you see that throughout all scripture, including chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle, verse 1, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, now this serpent, whatever it was, which is not the topic tonight, had the ability to speak. And it spoke in a language that Eve could understand. Didn't that seem strange to you ever? Or was there just one language, period, at this time in history? And even before this time in history, before all these creative processes took place regarding this planet. Even the serpent knew how to speak Eve's language because Eve obviously understood what this serpent was saying. Verse 8. Once again, after they eat the forbidden fruit, they discovered they were naked and Verse 8 says, and they heard the Lord God walk in the garden. And then the Lord God, in verse 9, called unto Adam. Once again, they had to understand what God was saying even after rebellion took place. And verse 13, the Lord God said unto the woman, over and over, verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent. Now, God's talking to the serpent in the same language. Probably, there's no other explanation but this, the language that the serpent used to talk to Eve. You get it? Everyone's communicating using a language. God was not communicating in French, the serpent in Spanish, and Adam and Eve knew English. And miraculously, even though there were three different languages going on at the same time, voila, they understood each other. So, sorry, that's not the way it happened. There was one language. And then you move on. where even Adam called his wife's name, Eve. But before I go there, or I'll just go there now. Let me just read you something. God communicated with Adam and Eve in Hebrew. I'll just pick it up at this point. Which is the language of the celestial beings and would logically be the original human language. I gave you the reasons and the logic behind why this possibly could be true. No other tongue but Hebrew is mentioned in Scripture for the earliest of biblical communication. Well, how do you know it's Hebrew? Could it have been something else? We'll see here in a minute. It is the language of the oldest manuscripts and is the language specifically mentioned when people were spoken to from on high in the Old and New Testaments. Obviously, speaking Hebrew, Adam named the birds and beasts as God brought them before him. The conscience, simplicity, energy, and fertility of the Hebrew can be seen by examining the names of the individuals appearing in the early chapters of Genesis. All are Hebrew. Adam means red or ruddy. Eve means life or life spring. Just look at the names of other Old Testament personalities and you will see that they all have Hebrew meanings. The language spoken by Adam must have been spoken by one after, one after another of his descendants. For the whole earth was one language and one speech. You can find that, by the way, if you want to follow along in Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 11, I mean not Hebrews, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. 
a more literal translation, and the whole earth was of one lip and of one words, meaning just one language. They all spoke and understood the language that had necessary words that God created that started the creative process in the first place. Understood? Back to what I was reading. The language spoken by Anna must have been spoken by one after another of his descendants. For the whole earth was of one language and one speech. This was after the flood, this was after the flood of Noah's time. And the population had increased considerably. It was a time of the people's journey east into the land of Shinar, the Mesopotamian Valley, where they decided to build a tower for a name unto themselves. Shinar would be like what present Iraq, Kuwait, some parts of West, West, I mean, eastern Jordan, eastern Syria, western Iran, that area. And there they decided to build a tower for a name unto themselves. That's the Tower of Babel. Genesis 10 tells of Nimrod, the son of Cush. And if you've been listening to the last day's teaching, Cush means chaos. The son of Cush, the son of Ham, who began his kingdom in Babel in the land of Shinar. The present world population is descended from the three sons of Noah which are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All previous lines of humanity were destroyed in the flood. Only eight survivors in that ark, besides the animals that survived, that were also placed in the ark. You got it? Three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Their wives would make six, Noah, and Noah's wife would be a total of eight persons. The present world population is descended from three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All previous lines of humanity were destroyed in the flood. It is recognized that Nimrod was instrumental in getting the people together to build a city and the tower. Yeah, Nimrod was an instrument, but I believe Nimrod was being guided by his father, Cush, and I gave my reasons for that in the last day series. You've got to find that somewhere in the series. It's somewhere around near 100 or so messages into the series. The father of chaos, I believe, was the main character with his son Nimrod taking direction from his father for people to get together and then eventually build this city and the tower, the Tower of Babel. The families of Ham and Japheth settled in the plains and sea coasts. The descendants of Ham, uh, Shem, excuse me, however, did not dwell in the plains of Shinar, but settled toward the mountains and the hills, countries of Mesha. You go to Genesis 10.30, which I don't have time to go to tonight. I'll just read it to you. And their dwelling was from Mesha as you go unto Sephar, a mount of, of the east. So the Shemites stayed in the high country, much as did Abraham later in Genesis 13. Now, what happened around that period in Genesis 13? Abraham and Lot finally split. Abraham gave Lot the first choice. He chose the best of the land. Then Abraham settled, and where he settled was more hillside and mountainous type of land territory. And it was not anywhere near the Tower of Babel. Neither did where Lot settled. But, it, but the whole point is, the Shemites had a tendency throughout their early history is to settle in hillside, countryside type lands. Construction of the Tower of Babel was the project of sons of Ham and Japheth under the directions of Nimrod and, I believe, the master planner, Cush. Reaching to the heavens, the tower was to be primarily a monument to man. Nah. Oh, I'm sure a man was proud of himself. But if you've been listening to the last day series, this is why it's hard to always 
read things to you without making the corrections because they just don't get it. They just look at Scripture and what they're dealing with and they just deal with that. Not putting all the information and history that you can put together to piece all of the history together. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes years and years and years to get to that point. And it's a forever learning process because new things are being discovered constantly. God knows how much would have been discovered if these Islamic countries didn't cause all the upheaval they have in the last 20 and 30 years. But that's another issue altogether. So here they are. Around the tower and the, the city of Babylon, which was planned in order to establish for themselves a fame independent of Yahweh. Well, they wanted a religion that they created that catered to them that was separate from Yahweh. This is a prime example of carnal man desiring to make a name for himself, yet seeking all sorts of excuses to deny the name of Yahweh, the Elohim of the earth. Now, Shem means name. That's the definition for Shem, name. And through Shem and his descendants, the good seed eventually begat the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is very unlikely that the descendants of Shem or the Semites were involved in this undertaking, for they did not join with those at the plains of the Shinar. Shemites were righteous and would not rebel against Yahweh. Furthermore, scholars assert that the Shemites were persecuted by Nimrod and dwelt apart. I don't know if most of you know that, but more and more of the information that's coming out, especially in the last 20 years or so, are finding, finding evidence where Shemites were persecuted by what they call tribal people that lived in a Mesopotamian area. In other words, in the area of Shinar, in the area of Cush and his son Nimrod. And after, even after the destruction of the Tower of Babel, you think they gave up their false religions and false practices of their pagan religion they created, which served false gods such as the moon, sun, and others? No. In fact, when these characters, Cush, Nimrod, start disappearing from the scene, Nimrod's wife was a vicious and even more dedicated to establishing a false religion. And it became forced upon people. And eventually, just not in the Mesopotamia area, but east, west, some south, and north of the Shinar area or the Mesopotamia Valley area, including Shemites. And Shemites came under attack and were persecuted by the clansmen of the, the Nimrod clan. But they still, for the most part, was not influenced by them. Now, the lineage of Shem is the key in showing that Hebrew is the heavenly language. Shem means name in Hebrew. And it was the Shemites who continued with Hebrew as their language. Hebrew belongs to the Western group of Semitic languages. The word Semitic is formed from the name of Shem, Noah's eldest son. In his blessings on Shem, Noah called Yahweh the Elohim of Shem and said Yahweh would dwell in the tents of Shem. You can find that in Genesis 9, verses 26 and 27 for those of you who are taking notes. Yahweh, of course, was the mighty one of the Hebrews. Well. I don't have time. Now, Shem, whose native tongue was Hebrew, lived 98 years during his great-grandfather Methuselah's time. Remember, Methuselah? Here's a Bible trivia question for you. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Or one, who is the man that lived the longest in the Bible? Methuselah. He lived longer than anyone, at least on record, as far as we know. Shem, whose native tongue was Hebrew, lived 98 years during his great-grandfather Methuselah's time. Remember, the earth was one language at this time. 
Shem had nearly 100 years to carry on a discourse with and receive instruction from his great-grandfather. So Shem, before the flood, had nearly 100 years to carry on a discourse. In other words, receive instruction with and receive instruction from his great-grandfather. Methuselah lived and cheered 243 years of his lifespan with Adam. So Methuselah, being the oldest man that ever lived, up to that point and thereafter, not only was living during Shem's lifespan for 98 years, he goes so far back that he spent 243 years of his lifespan with Adam. Imagine, just imagine, folks. Put yourself in this visual concept. You're Shem, and you had access to the first created Adam, mankind, being. The first person of our kind that God ever created. Not just for 243 days, but 243 years. You can spend time with Adam. Imagine his source of information. And obviously, if, you're, if you can spend that much time with Adam because he lived 243 years alongside with Adam, what kind of information you can get? Well, how could you get any information if you spoke different tongues? We know after the Tower of Babel, which came after the flood, because of the tower, and what really was in their heart, God broke up the children of Ham and Japheth that gathered together in that valley, and he confused their languages. He confused their languages, but the Shemites didn't dwell there. So that leaves the question, did the Shemites have their language confused. I contest, no, they didn't. They were not part of that confusion factor. Two hundred forty-three years with Adam. What kind of questions would you ask them? Including, why in the heck did you listen to Eve? That'd probably be first and foremost on my list. No, not really. What was it like walking and talking with God in the garden? Then after hearing everything he had to say about it, then probably my follow-up question is, what in the heck were you thinking when you were listening to Eve? Then if Eve was still alive in Shem's period of life, I mean Methuselah's period of life, I would ask her, what in the heck were you thinking? Anyway, let's move on before I get stuck on that. Shem had nearly 100 years to carry on a discourse with and receive instruction from his great-grandfather. Methuselah lived and shared 243 years span with Adam and another 600 years with Noah. Noah spent some time with Methuselah. Which spent, and Methuselah spent some time with everyone up to that point. You think about it. From Adam on up to the flood, Methuselah, in, it was not called a Shemite line at that time, but a God chosen line that didn't rebel like others before the flood because the sons of God or the watchers came down and brought all types of understanding of things that God yet didn't want man to know and put it into use mostly in an evil way for evil purposes man was willingly led astray and they rebelled and they rebelled but even in that rebellion and by the way 
what language did the sons of God use to convince first the daughters and everyone else to rebel against God? In a sense, it's almost like the Garden of Eden, of Eden again, except sin already has been introduced and there's no garden. But they were willing to listen to fallen beings that deceived. So what was the language of these fallen beings, these watchers, these sons of God, that came into the daughters of man and produced giants? How do they communicate? Or did they? I believe they did. Because there's a heavenly language and there's an earthly language and they're one language, not different languages. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. Noah's son Shem lived until Abraham was 150 years old. And we've covered this somewhat before when Abraham life was probably at risk. His mother sent him to Noah and Shem. And Shem lived probably being his most influential person because he lived much longer after the flood than Noah when Abraham was living. He became probably, if you take other books outside the Bible, which the Bible refers to, Abraham's instructor, not only the things of God, but as we already covered, even how to read the heavenlies through the stars about the coming Messiah. Now, Noah's son Shem lived until Abraham was 150 years old. And maybe some of these things that we already covered now makes more sense to you. When you put all this and line it up, and maybe you need to write it down, line up all these different periods of time where these people went from one lifespan to another, but they crossed over. So one didn't die, and another one had to pick up and start from scratch again. All the information from the previous lifespan was passed on, and it wasn't lost in eventually what we eventually call the Shemite line. Noah's son Shem lived until Abraham was 50 years old, and Isaac was 50 years of age when Shem died. So even Isaac, which I wouldn't be surprised, because I believe Shem dwelt somewhere around Jerusalem area as we know today. Even Isaac didn't dwell in Shem's camp for a while, being instructed. But that's just speculation. So here's a family of which the progenitor Adam spoke in Hebrew with Yahweh, his creator. Parents even today teach their children the natural native language. And there is no reason to assume that Adam's was any language other than Hebrew. By virtue of his family line, the Hebrew language that they all spoke, inheritance, inheritance of a language continued down to Genesis 11, 1, where the whole earth was of one tongue. Then follows, the cha then follows chapter 12, telling of a rebellion of the people exploited by Nimrod, joined him to build a tower in the plains of Shinar. It was upon the descendants of Ham and Japheth that the confusions of languages came. Shemites were not involved, and so their Hebrew language is not infected. Infected or affected. Here is, the more confirm here is more confirmation. We find in Genesis 10, 21, that Shem is the father of all the children of Eber. Or Eber, Eber. From Eber, we get the word Hebrew. Go to Genesis 10, 24. Let's verify that. Yep, it talks about all the begets. And there you first see Eber. In Genesis 10, actually, Genesis 10, it, it's uh, unto Shem in 21, unto Shem also, the father of all children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. Verse 21, not verse 24. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. 
So here's more confirmation. We find in Genesis 10, 21, that Shem is the father of all the children of Eber. From Eber, we get the word Hebrew. Hebrew. But when you dig into that, another definition is supposed to be carried with that word Hebrew. Hardly ever used. And that is, you might want to write this down. I don't have time to go to the board, so just write it down. It could also mean a people or a region beyond. A people or a region beyond what? That is the question. Since we are introduced to this name here, and everyone has accepted that the definition for Eber is the, the word Hebrew, that's where we get the word Hebrew, then what does that people or region of beyond mean? Because if you understand what Eber means, and everyone agrees that it means, all the scholars do, Hebrew, that's how you would define the name Eber. The definition would be Hebrew. We, that's where we get the word Hebrew. Got it? That's where we get the word Hebrew. Well, then write it down as I did in my Bible here. It also means, besides where we get the word Hebrew, is a people coming from and beyond coming from and beyond beyond what well because of its placement here in scripture of noah's sons and the noah's family's record we only can assume it's not referring to a region here but some event that just recently happened That was earth changing, or as they say in today's modern language, a game changer. So a people coming from and beyond what? The flood. The flood. That's the major event that took place between chapter 7, 8, 9, and then eventually 10. When everyone's being blessed, including uh, Shem in verse 26 in chapter 9 and he said blessed be the Lord God of Shem and then family records are given in chapter 10 and you get down to verse 21 chapter 10 unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber and if Eber is where we get the word Hebrew the father and the children of the people coming from and beyond the flood the eight faithful Before the flood, now after the flood, eight survivors. Eight survivors. The children of one of those survivors, Shem and his descendants, were the ones that would remain faithful to God. And the children of Japheth and Ham would go searching and creating their own God and eventually falling away from the true Elohim and seeking their own desires and a God they should think they should worship that probably was not so many demanding on their life. You got it? One has to but to study the names of people and places in the book of Genesis to acknowledge they all are definitely Hebrew and have names with Hebrew meaning. Children learn the language of their parents. Even though they might be reared in a foreign country, it is not unusual for a group of people to cluster together in a foreign land because of the difficulties of the language. There are many examples of immigrants arriving in the United States and settling in areas where their native tongue is spoken and their native customs practiced. Many cities contain foreign enclaves where common cultures and specific languages predominate. Some are known as Chinatown or Germantown or Little Italy, sections of the city, or Little Italy sections of the city. These people settled in areas that were, that were less hostile toward their background, language, and culture. This was also true of biblical Hebrews. Beginning with chapter 12 of Genesis, the Bible focuses upon the name uh, upon the man Abraham and his descendants Isaac and Jacob. As was shown, Shem lived 98 years before the flood, 502 years after the flood, and 75 years after Abraham entered Canaan. I believe he was Melchizedek. Now that's another message. All of these men held a special relationship with Yahweh. 
He was very real to them, and he occasionally spoke directly to them in their Hebrew language. The Ten Commandments were written with the finger of Elohim. On what language, by the way? On which language was used? The Ten Commandments were written with the finger of Elohim on two tables of stone and then given to Moses. They were written in the Hebrew language. Israel stood before Mount Sinai and listened as Yahweh spoke in a language that they could understand. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible in Hebrew. This helped unify the Israelites and also establish Hebrew as the language of the temple and worship in the synagogues. That's scripture. You don't even have to speculate with that. It further can be shown that this was Sephardic Hebrew as opposed to the later Ashkenazin Hebrew, which was influenced by the Germanic language of Eastern Europe. There's a tongue twisters. What is Sephardic Hebrew? It further, can, further can be shown that this was Sephardic or Sephardim Hebrew as opposed to Ashkenazin. Well, what's the difference? Well, we eventually became, we, we are more, we became more aware of what's the difference between Sephardic and the other Ash Kunasin Hebrew, much later period in time, we see the Sephardic Hebrew used where? Used where in history? After the dispersion, after the Roman culture devastated the Roman Empire, Jerusalem in 7 AD, as the centuries passed by, and the Jews became dispersed, we see the, probably the most preserved form of the Sephardic outside of Israel, Hebrew, in the Spanish Jews and the Portuguese Jews. And the Ash Kunasin Hebrew was more of a central and Eastern Europe, or a Germanic type Hebrew. Now, what's the difference? The Sephardic is anchored to the mesmeric, mesmeretic vowel pointing system, which shows that it was in vogue when the Mesorets established a system of vocalizing Hebrew by vowel points. The Sephardic Hebrew is the language of the temple and has been preserved for us by the Yemenite and Spanish and Portuguese Jews. Even today, young Jewish children learn to read and write Hebrew no matter what country they reside in to become eligible for their bar, or as we recognize it here in the United States, bar mitzvah. The Old Testament has handed down from the Old Testament was handed down from the Hebrew originals, with the possible exception of Ezra 4 8 to 6 18 and Daniel 2 4 to 7 28, which already covered that in the last day series. Note that in Nehemiah 8.8, 8, the people were instructed in the law, likely in the Aramaic paraphrase, the language of the Babylonian captivity. The Levites went among the people, teaching what they had heard so that the Hebrew scriptures would be clear to them. By Daniel's time, both Hebrew and Aramaic was, were used. With the exceptions previously noted, we can safely say that the Old Testament was handed down to us by those who spoke and wrote Hebrew. It is apparent, therefore, that when Yahweh spoke to these Hebrew men, that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. The name Hebrew derives from Eber, the great-grandson of Shem, which means name. Eber was a Hebrew and spoke Hebrew. So did his great-grandfather so did his great so did his great-grandfather Shem. Parents always passed down their language to their children and so on. Shem would speak the same language that his great-grandfather Methuselah spoke, with whom he shared 98 years of his life in the homeland. Methuselah would speak the Hebrew language that Adam spoke, with whom he shared 243 years of his life. Some scholars believe, I just got the 15-minute signal. I've got to rush through this now. Some Bible scholars believe that the second chapter of Luke relating to, to Jesus being left behind by Mary and Joseph, 
who later found them in the temple discussing the Hebrew scriptures, shows that Jesus, even at a young age, was very knowledgeable of Hebrew and was ready for his bar mitzvah. He did read temple, he did read temple or Sephardic or Sephardim Hebrew, although some say he also spoke Aramaic, a close dialect. Later we learn that Jesus was in the synagogue of Nazareth and while there, while there read from the book of Isaiah. Hebrew is still today the language of worship and is heard in the synagogues when prayer and scripture is heard. In examining the New Testament, we find again that when one was spoken to from the heavens, it always was in the Hebrew tongue, even in the New Testament. And you have a multiple of languages circulating now, even in Israel. In chapter 1 of Luke, we read that the priest, Zechariah, was performing his duties in the temple. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him and related how Elizabeth was soon to have a son. Who would be called John? Certainly a priest of the course would be distressed in his native Hebrew tongue, the language of temple worship. Later we learn that the virgin Mary was also visited by Gabriel, who proclaimed the soon coming birth of Jesus the Messiah. Luke chapter 1 is where you can find that, by the way. Both Mary and Joseph were descended from the lineage of King David, the ruler of Israel, or the tribe of Judah. In chapter 2 of Luke, we read of a Judean shepherds watching their flocks by night when the celestial beings came to them announcing the birth of the Redeemer of Israel. The language used to communicate was Hebrew and was understood by uneducated pastoral shepherds. I, and maybe I'll do it again this year, preach through those, those scriptures during Christmas. In Matthew 3.17 and Luke 3.22 is the account of the baptism of the Messiah. A voice came from heaven declaring that this was the beloved son in whom he was well pleased. Obviously in the Hebrew tongue. In both Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 4 is the account of Satan, the fallen angel, speaking with the Hebrew, Yeshua. Obviously in Hebrew. This fallen angel was the anointed cherub that covers who was in the presence of of Yahweh until iniquity was found in him. In Job chapter 1 and 2, we learn that Satan carried on a conversation with Yahweh, which would have been in Hebrew, the heavenly language. <coughs> Acts 9 tells of the apostle Paul being struck down on Damascus Road. Recounting this experience to King Agrippa, Paul says of the heavenly voice of Yeshua, and I've covered, covered that last week in Acts 26, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. There is the clearest identification that what Paul heard, that voice speaking unto him, he says it was in the Hebrew tongue. Saul, Saul, why per persecuted thou me? And because of Paul's education and where he grew up. He knew more than Hebrew. Why not choose one of the other tongues that he knew? It was Hebrew. And when we are all fallen to earth, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? It is hard for thee to kick, is, is, is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? Paul inquired of the speaker and I said, who are you, master? And he says, I am Jesus whom ye persecute. This was after Jesus' death and resurrection. He was still speaking Hebrew. Jesus told us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be in the kingdom, Matthew 8, 11, and there will be a, undoubtedly be many other ancient worthies who have been chosen to be in that glorious kingdom. All those resurrected people will be brought back to life in a country that even now is speaking Hebrew as its national language. Notably, in 1948, when it was admitted to the United Nations, the tiny nation of Israel established Hebrew as its national language. Ben Yehuda, known as the father of modern Hebrew, already has, had prepared an updated Hebrew dictionary of the Hebrew language. It was his desire to see Hebrew revived and made alive as a spoken tongue. Today, Hebrew is the official language of the land of Palestine. Jewish immigrants must learn Hebrew as part of their orientation, assimilation into Israeli society and culture. Hebrew is the heavenly language. It was spoken to Adam and Eve, and down through history was spoken to all aging worthies. 
the prophets who were given messages from on high were those who spoke Hebrew. When Yahweh had a message for a foreign nation, such as Assyria, he spoke to Jonah and Nahum, who understood Hebrew. Then in turn, warned the Assyrians of impending doom. And they had to warn them in their language. When Jesus returns, he will go to the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. He will return to deliver a nation that is already speaking Hebrew. The Hebrew-speaking Jews will recognize him. He will come again to his own, and this time they will receive him. He will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and that they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. You can find that in Zechariah. He will return to his people and save the tents of Judah first. It should be understood that at this time we can pray to God in any language, any tongue, because he is not limited to audible speech as humans are. The one who made... Man's tongue and ears can bypass speech. In other words, whatever your language is. The language spoken in Eden by Yahweh was Hebrew. The angelic beings continued to communicate with those who understood Hebrew. Yahweh spoke to people through prophets who understood Hebrew. Find it different. Especially after the point where Eber's on the scene. Find me something different. In the New Testament, the angelical messenger spoke to Hebrew-speaking people. Jesus spoke and read Hebrew in the synagogue. He spoke to Saul in the Hebrew tongue. There's no questioning that happening. We have that as a record. It's clear. From all this evidence and more, increasing numbers of scholars are coming to agree with what the entire Bible, which what, what the entire Bible was originally written in, and that was Hebrew. A growing number agreed that the Bible was written in part or in whole in the Hebrew tongue. That's all I have time for tonight. But next time, I want to read you something that I believe further confirms something that goes back to the 1940s. That further confirms as a point of verification what God wanted to reestablish once again in 1948. The Hebrew tongue. The Hebrew language. Throughout biblical history, there is a spoken language. I read it really quick. You probably have to listen to this message more than once because I'm fighting against time. But throughout written scripture, there is enough evidence that God used Hebrew as a spoken language after Eber. Eber is where we get the word Hebrew. It's a people that were called and chosen that came beyond the flood. That's the other definition that I had given you in this sermon tonight. Meaning, it's the same lineage that were faithful before the flood and the lineage that would remain faithful after the flood through the Shemite line. You get it, folks? And Eber was a continuation of that. There's plenty of evidence after Eber's day what the language was. Paul confirms even his communication with the heavenlies was in Hebrew when God had to get his attention. And like I said, Paul could speak other languages and also understand them. God chose Hebrew. It was a continuation. With that assumption and when tracing all the family lineage, who lived before the flood and who lived after the flood, from one lifespan to another, you only could assume that they were communicating in the same language. And the same language was 
only, I contend, Hebrew, because there's only one language at the time. It was not till after the Tower of Babel where the confusion came in and God created. It's kind of a miraculous, miraculous event, if you really think about it. Confusion amongst the people and gave them different languages. Just think about it. Reorganizing, reprogramming their brain where certain groups would understand certain languages. If you really think about it, it's kind of amazing. I know we read right through those, we read right through those stories and never stop and then realize what a miracle that was. But since the Shemites did not participate in what was being established after the flood, man's rebellion against God once again. How? By creating what really disappointed is really an understatement, but really gets God angry, and that's putting another God before him, another created man-made created God. See, God cannot be created by man. Man is created by God. And when that happened, he confused the Japheth and the Ham lineage of people, and then they dispersed, going in different directions. But the Shemites stayed in place. They stayed in place. Now, it didn't take very long for even the Shemites to kind of disperse also after the Tower of the Babel from the areas they were generally located, Abraham being a case of point. But God knew where he wanted him, and he brought him back. That's obvious when you read the Genesis record. Not only brought him back, because I do believe the sources that the Bible quotes outside the Bible, where it tells that Abraham, because for the fear of his life, his mother sent him to his relatives, his great-grandfather and so forth, to be preserved and hopefully his life spared. And while he was there, I believe he got an instruction of a lifetime, partly with Noah and most of the time with Shem. And I believe that's where he learned how to read the stars. And eventually, God would have to remind them to review again what you've been taught, which declares there's a Messiah coming. If you haven't heard that part of the messages in the last day series, I recommend you do. Because this won't make much sense what I'm saying now unless you have a grasp of what Abraham knew. And once I, you hear what I presented, I think it'll give you a whole new perspective. What Abraham did know and didn't know. He knew a lot more than most people thought. And bottom line is, where did he get that from? Mostly from Shem. Well, how did he communicate with Shem? Obviously, Abraham knew Hebrew also. But his father, my, this is my guess now, my speculation. His father were attracted by those false gods and false religions. And either his father or his father's father migrated into those areas and finally wound up in Ur. Either that, or you, if that's not the reason, then financial reasons for financial gains and purposes. But that's a speculation. Nevertheless, God's in control. He brought Abraham back. He changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And for most Christians, he's known as the father of, of faith. Why? Go to last day series and you'll find out why. But Hebrew's been always the language. It's the chosen language. It's the language not only the angelic beings knew, but also Adam-like beings. This is the language of communication. This is the language of choice by God. This is the only language that didn't get changed after the Tower of Babel. From Eber on, there's plenty of evidence, and I only gave you a very small portion of it, where it clearly shows Hebrew being the language of choice including what will be used in the temple worship when that would be established. And it was preserved. Even thousands of years later, even though they were dispersed and being chased out of every country, the Sepharic Jews, the closest to that pure language as possible, was preserved in the Yemenite area and the Spanish and Portuguese areas of this world. 
and then eventually in the Germanic tribes, but it's not as pure of a language as I read to you in the Seferic or the Seferidim dialect in how the language was supposed to be used and learned and pass on from generation to generation. God's in control. He's established what he already established way before creation to be the word, the logos, that would be the operating force, not only in creation, but everything after that and everything throughout eternity. Well, I don't know Hebrew. Well, if you don't learn it now, I guarantee you, this is my belief, sooner or later, just as those Tower of Babel people were instantly educated in a new language, I believe in our new bodies, we'll have the same process taking place where we understand whatever the pure language is, and I believe it's Hebrew. And that's my message for tonight.